he had all the studies to back it up, et cetera, and all this. And I'm just like, dude, have you ever coached a real human being? Like, do you know how people work? Do you understand the limitations of this? It looks great on paper. It looks great in a study. It looks great in a textbook. You apply it to the real world. It falls apart completely. It doesn't hold up. Ah, uh, yes. Recomping. This is now the holy grail of how to change your body composition. So suddenly bulking and cutting is yesterday's news and recomping is what we want to do going forward. So as you have surmised by the title of this episode, not a fan, but we're going to dig into why specifically, what the limitations of this are and why other approaches are still going to be better for most people. That and some more coming up today. It's episode 256 of The Drop Set. Let's hit it. What's up, everybody? Real quick before we jump in here, just a quick reminder, follow this show on Instagram at The Drop Set Podcast. Leave your messages there. Shoot an audio message, video message. Let me know what's on your mind. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. Leave a comment with some questions or anything that you want to see in future episodes. So let's get to it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 256 of The Drop Set. I am your host for today, Darren Starr. For those listening in audio-only podcast land, hello, thank you, as always. Uh, many of you have been with me for a long time. I appreciate that. For those watching on YouTube, hey, how we doing here? This video is a little different in that it is uh, less produced, less edited, a little bit more free-flowing. It's a podcast, after all. So uh, I am currently back from travel now. I was off on the West Coast for a week, had a little bit of an adventure, story for another time, I'll save it. Needless to say, I survived, I'm okay, wasn't perfect. Uh, still some lingering effects of sickness from last week, and uh, I was sleep-deprived for much of the trip as well, which did not make for a, uh, a good week on prep. It was okay, just not great. So um, we're going to dig in today. We got a few things to talk about really quick before we jump in though. I did want to just do a super quick plug for the courses that I have going online. There are three of them that are in development simultaneously. This is Hypertrophy University, Macro Bootcamp, and Bikini Blueprint. Bikini Blueprint is kind of a comprehensive program that includes the other two as well. So um, there will be some uh, some logistical things to figure out if somebody purchases one of those and they want to go to the Bikini Blueprint. How do we handle that? I'll figure that out. So, um, so uh, Hypertrophy University and Macro Bootcamp are slated for launch June 1 and July 1, respectively. Um, recording has started, editing has started on those, and actually for Hypertrophy University, some of those uh, videos will be going online in the next week or two, specifically. I'm going to kind of roll those out as I get them done. So um, you can read about that at, if you go to 5 digital.com Check that out. You can read about all the course offerings there. You can pre-order if you're so inclined as well. So that being said, let's dig into what the agenda is for today. Episode 256. Yes, indeed. So what is inside this? It is May 10th, 2024. We're going to talk about one of the biggest questions that I get asked most often, which is how long does it take to see results if I were to hire you as a coach? Um, you can kind of guess, probably based on the tone of voice, what my thoughts are on that question. <laughs> It's a difficult question to answer, uh, impossible, in fact, but we're going to dig in on some of the things that kind of prompt that question, and what I want to focus on is what can we do to influence that answer? And then uh, we're going to talk about why recomping is largely a myth. So we, let's dig in on that right now. Why you don't want to recomp. Um, so let's first of all define what a recomp is before we get too deep into the weeds here. So basically, it's building muscle and losing fat at the same time. This is going against the conventional wisdom of you should be in a growth phase, a bulk, or you should be in a cutting phase, a deficit. Um, a recomp would be something that would be considered to be more advantageous because you can do both of those at the same time and avoid the extremes in body composition changes that you would get from going with one of those other options. Um, it's uh, often thought that these, ha the, these two things, both building muscle and losing fat, kind of happen at the same rate, kind of cancel each other out, so the scale doesn't really move a whole lot. Um, in practicality, though, that is usually wishful thinking. Um, so you will notice for somebody who's doing that that they are uh, really 
maintaining more than anything else. They're not really making any change in their body composition. They're doing a lot of work. They're, you know, working hard, but they don't really have enough food in their system to really build muscle. They're doing some cardio, but not really enough to push them into deficit. They're just largely maintaining and they're doing more work than they need to in order to maintain. So that's usually what happens here. Um, realistically, there's probably other things going on under the hood as well. And we'll talk about some of those too. So recomping can happen. Here, here's the thing. It's not like this is totally a myth. It is largely a myth, but it applies to certain populations. So it can occur in circumstances, if, if in certain circumstances. If you are new to training, you can absolutely recomp and probably for a good bit. Uh, similarly, anything that would reset your training age, this is one thing that I talk about in Hypertrophy University, is your training age that of a beginner, intermediate, or advanced. This does not necessarily mean how long have you been training, but what is your proficiency level? You could be training for 10 or 15 years and still a beginner if you haven't really applied yourself and tried to learn things. Conversely, you could be fairly advanced six months into it if you just make that your life and you're reading and researching all the time and applying that in the gym. You can accelerate your training age pretty quickly. So uh, for new trainees or people who have reset their training age, and realistically, the next two things are both, they both fall into that category to some extent. If you have a significant change in your training intensity, you have basically dropped your training age. So the, the thing about this is that you, as far as training age is concerned, you always want to be a beginner because beginners make the most gains. As soon as you progress to advanced, your gains are going to slow down tremendously. You just think about it. The longer you train, the longer you lift. If you gain 10 pounds of muscle in your first year, do you think you're going to gain 10 pounds of muscle in your 15th year? Give me a break. No, it's not linear like that. So you always want to be more of a beginner. So anything that you can do to downregulate your training age is going to be a big deal. And so a significant increase in your training intensity can absolutely downregulate your training age. So this could just mean taking on a new training program that hits you totally different. It could be an increase or a reduction in your overall training volume that can then facilitate an adjustment in your training intensity. It could be something as simple as going to a new gym and suddenly the environment changes you completely. You're surrounded by different people. Your intensity goes up and suddenly you drop down from intermediate. Now you're gaining more like a beginner just because you're so much more dialed in mentally. So anything that you can do to downregulate your training age is the goal there. And also if you introduce PEDs, physique enhancing drugs, that can certainly do it as well. That can kick somebody from intermediate down to beginner as far as the expectations that you might have as far as changes that you'd see in your physique over time. How to recomp in textbook terms. Here's the key in textbook terms. What you do is you find maintenance. So maintenance we will define as your intake and expenditure level, the combination thereof that puts you around maintenance level. People say, what are my maintenance calories? I'm like, it depends. How hard do you want to work? If you want to do cardio seven days a week, your maintenance calories will be higher than if you don't want to do any cardio at all. It's the combination of the two. It's your intake and your expenditure. You have to train hard. You have to recover well. I would recommend some moderate cardio. You don't have to do a ton during a recomp. I don't think that's necessarily productive. Just because, again, you have to train hard. The more cardio you do, it's going to pull away from that training intensity to some extent. So uh, the, the key here is understanding that maintenance... First of all, it's a very active process. I will work with a lot of people who will cut down to a certain level of body fat, and then they're like, I want to maintain here, not understanding that what they need to do to maintain that is pretty close to the same amount of work it took them to get there. They, they uh, People will often think like, oh, I cut down, I'm really good on my diet, I'm doing a ton of cardio, I'm doing everything right, and then I can just kind of chill out on all that, and I should be able to maintain there. No, that is not how the human body works. You need to maintain a pretty high level of work to, to maintain a, a level of leanness that most people would have as a target. So there are some issues with this. So maintenance, it's not a static intake target. It does have to be coordinated with your output and your output over time is going to be more variable. You know, you're going to have phases where you're just not doing as much cardio. You're going to have phases where you're more or less active. Recomping is something that will take some time. So you'll go through many months of a recomp phase if you do it correctly. And during that time, your expenditure may fluctuate a lot, just, you know, seasonal work, um, you know, uh, 
weather patterns change, suddenly you're not taking as many steps outside, that can have an influ influence on it as well. So then you need to modulate your intake around that as well. So it's a little bit of a pain. There's just a lot to manage. That in and of itself doesn't really make it a problem. Um, but it does need to be precise. So as it says, maintaining a precise maintenance expenditure over the long term for most people is a pain, but also being on it as far as your intake as well. So you think recomp, cool. Well, it's not a cut, so I don't have to be super strict. Oh, you do. Absolutely. Because again, it's maintenance range that we want to be in. It's coordinated with your expenditure, but it's a pretty tight range. You don't have a lot of wiggle room in there. So it is going to require more discipline, more stick to than a lot of people might think, uh, and more, more precision overall, and just kind of a more psychotic level of adherence to everything much like you would expect if you were on a cut, whether pre-contest or for anything else. The caveat here is that in recomp, it's not necessarily a cut. So there's this expectation that you can get away with a little less precision. And it's simply not true. Um, maintenance is also a, a range and it is going to fluctuate. And if you have a bit of OCD, um, trying to keep track of that can kind of drive you nuts a little bit. I've certainly experienced that myself. So the challenge is, it's, it's a delicate dance, like I said. Um, if you're trying to build muscle, that's typically going to require a surplus unless we are in that uh, one of those categories that we talked about before, you know, new trainee, reduction in training age, introducing PEDs, that kind of thing. Uh, trying to reduce body fat typically requires a deficit. And if we're trying to do both of these at maintenance intake, you're not really aligning what you're doing with either of your goals. You're kind of trying to split the difference and hedge your bets. And in so doing, this really exposes the weakness of this, is that you're not really leaning very hard into either, either direction. Uh, so realistically, in practical terms, we're probably going to have to be a little bit south of maintenance um, because we need to be, uh, we also need to be in one of those special circumstances where you're able to grow in a deficit, but you're not going to reduce body fat if you're not at a deficit. You can grow if you're not in a surplus under one of those special circumstances. You cannot lean out if you're at, at maintenance or at a surplus by definition. So you have to be in a deficit. So we need to be in a little one, just not much of one. This is where it becomes tricky. So the real issue here is that it has to be very precise, it has to be very consistent, it has to be very regimented, and it's going to take a long time. And results are going to be slow. And the real issue here is that there are very few people who have the patience to pull this off. Because building muscle, if you lean into a growth phase aggressively, like, fuck staying lean, I just want to get big and huge, cool, it's still a slow process. So now, if you mitigate that by saying, well, I'm going to stay really lean to the point where I'm actually going to be trying to reduce body fat at the same time. Uh, yeah, you are not going to have any perceptible change in your muscle mass. You are not going to notice anything happening. You're going to be like, I'm working so hard. What the fuck's happening here? Like, well, you're at maintenance. You're not really building. You're not really leaning out. You're just kind of spinning your wheels unless you are again in one of those special circumstances. So uh, it's just the lack of patience. You're not, not going to be leaning out quickly. You're not going to be growing quickly. Um, in bodybuilding terms, growing quickly is still slow. Uh, but the, the issue is just that you're going to lose patience because you don't see anything happening. If you don't see anything happening, why are you putting in so much damn work to get it done? So the people I've seen plenty of videos on this from guys that I respect, like Jeff Nippard. He put out a video a while back, like why you need to recomp any body fat or, or slow down the accumulation. So this isn't just to say like, well, throw a caution to the wind, just get as fat as you possibly can. We'll build muscle along in the process. Like, yeah, that works. I've done that too. But God, the cleanup on the back end is a pain in the ass. Trust me, I'm living through it now. 40 pounds down in my prep and uh, still four weeks to go. So it's not fun. <laughs> it's doable. It's not fun. Would I, here's the question. Would I like to keep it cleaner next time around? Yeah, but not that much cleaner. Like if I set it up so I've got 30 pounds to drop instead of 40, I think that's reasonable. And I think that should be doable. Um, you just can't get super lazy during your off season, which, yeah, I was working hard, but dietarily I got a little lazy for sure. So that's where those extra 10 pounds came from. If I clean that up, not a big deal. Um, leaning out is slow. Also, it's not as slow as growth, but it's still a relatively slow process. You know, the whole marathon, not a sprint thing. But if you intentionally slow down that rate to be closer to maintenance so you can ostensibly grow a little bit, again, you're going to test your patience. Uh, and there, you're going to find some very, very obvious practical limitations in doing that. So our other options are the tried and true. Grow, you know, we focus on keeping it lean. Just don't obsess about, you know, every last little, you know, ounce of fat that you put on your body. 
ounces here and there are okay. You put on a pound a week, you're going too fast. Chill out on your surplus, buddy. That's it. So the more experienced you are when it comes to lifting, the higher your training, ex the higher your training age, you're likely going to need less of a surplus than you might think. Now, that is not to say that your calories are going to be lower. It's just, you know, the, the higher your training age, the more muscle you likely have on your frame. So the, the caloric needs just to maintain that mass are going to be higher. But you're not necessarily going to need a 1,500 calorie surplus. You could probably get away with a four to 600 calorie surplus just fine. And it'll take a little bit of time to dial in on what that is exactly. But it's doable. It's doable. Those are knowable things. Um, and if you're cutting... That's the other option. Aim to drop one to two pounds per week, depending on how big you are. You know, if you're a 115-pound woman, a pound a week is pretty aggressive. If you're a 230-pound guy, two pounds a week is probably a little conservative. So those are ranges to work with. But, you know, something close to that would be pretty good. Um, you want to focus on maintaining your training performance as you do that. You want to keep that at a high level just to ensure that you're retaining muscle. You know, it, it's pretty much always going to be non-zero your rate of muscle loss it's always going to be a little bit but if you're maintaining good training performance it's going to be less and less of an issue so the biggest problem that i have here with recomping is really just the practical limitations and the fact that it's going to require more patience than most human beings have and the process is slow even when you aggressively lean into one phase or the other slowing that down more um, we start to bring in words like glacial like you're just not going to notice anything happening. And I have worked with people who have that level of patience and can pull that off. They are rare, like, you know, one in 500, probably something like that just is not common. Now, if that's you, great, this might be okay. I would still say you would benefit from doing one of the other options. Just pick a lane and stay in it um, and just manage things, you know, a little bit, a little bit more tightly there, um, unless you're one of those special circumstances, in which case, great, lean into that and recomp. Absolutely. It still works. The other problem here is recomping is something that generally takes a good level of skill and experience. And most people that are going to be qualified to do it are going to be new and not have that experience and not have that skill with their training. They are going to be, you know, a very low training age. They're going to be beginners and they're not really going to be able to capitalize on those potential gains as much as somebody who has a higher level of experience, but that person is kind of outside the scope of who this is going to work for. So moral of the story, recomping great on paper. Um, not something that I would advocate for, uh, when working with a client, sometimes I will have a client, like I always want to start with somebody around maintenance level, just to kind of assess and see where that number is. And sometimes I will notice they do recomp for a short time. It's usually a handful of weeks. It's not very long. And then suddenly their body realizes like, oh, this is not new anymore. And the newness has worn off. And then therefore the adaptations start to take place. And then we kind of need to lean a little bit more heavily in one direction or the next. So don't be afraid to just stick with the old school approaches, bulk, cut. I know if you, if you look at videos on YouTube these days, every single content creator out there, um, has something where it's like bulking is dead. Don't bulk anymore. Even Mike Israel, who I respect a lot has fallen prey to this and is throwing out clickbaity bullshit like this. Um, when really, I mean, that's, that's the title and the thumbnail of the video, but that's not really the substance of it. So you're not going to get any of that shit from me. Like if, if you see a video from me on YouTube and you're like, wow, that's weird. It's like, I'm delivering on that. Okay. I'm not going to put in clickbaity shit or anything like that. I'm working with a coach for YouTube right now, actually, who has encouraged me to like lean into that a little bit. And I just said, no, I will not because there is nothing more annoying than that. So as I grow this channel, I'm going to do it authentically and without misleading people. So, um, yeah, so bulk and cut. Absolutely. Tried and true. Been using them for decades. They're still the best option out there in practical terms for just about everybody. Whew. All right. Quick break here. I just wanted to remind everybody, check out fivestarphysique.com. You can read about everything that I do there as far as coaching. I have workout programs available, some merch, etc., all kinds of cool stuff. You can also check out fivestardigital.com where I have all of my online courses available. Right now, I'm working on Bikini Blueprint, Hypertrophy University, Macro Boot Camp, Men's Physique Blueprint, all kinds of stuff going on there. Those courses are going to start to become available June 1st of this year. I'm working my tail off getting those things ready for prime time. You can actually go there right now, pre-order those courses if you want, 
or hit me up through Five Star Physique with any questions that you have on any of those courses. I'd be more than happy to help you out. All right, welcome back. I had to ditch the hoodie. It was uh, getting a little overheated here in the uh, Five Star Physique studio. So um, quick reminder, fivestardigital.com. Check it out. Course is going live soon. Hypertrophy University, Macro Boot Camp, of which I now have a logo, um, and Bikini Blueprint as well. Followed closely by Men's Physique Blueprint will be next. There's a couple other offerings as well. So I don't want to overload myself too much, but I got a lot of ideas and I want to get all these things out. So Next segment here, second and final segment for today. Um, how long does it take to see results? The most common question that I get outside of, hey, what is your opinion on creatine? The problem with that, by the way, the creatine question, is that no matter how many times I address it on social media or on YouTube or on the podcast or anything else, everybody always just keeps asking. Um, and... Like my big picture takeaway on that is the people who typically ask that question have other things that they should be worrying about. Like, hey, let's follow our diet, first of all. <laughs> let's, let's worry about that. Um, I don't want to digress too much, but just on the topic of common questions, there's creatine and then there's this. How long does it take to see results? Um, the creatine question usually comes from existing clients. Um, this comes from prospective clients who want to know like, hey, if I'm going to invest some money in this coach, how long until I can actually see some results? And the answer is, I don't fucking know, man uh, or woman. You know, I, it is, it is uh, the, the final bullet point on this slide says it all. This is asking something that is unknowable. Everybody wants to know this, but the, the obvious truth here is if I could answer it, I would just plaster that answer all over my website and then hold out my hand asking for money. That's it. Um, it is completely unknowable. And I think realistically, if you think about it, you know that nobody can answer this question. So I like to think of this as being a question that somebody asks as kind of like a bullshit detector for a coach. I'm giving people the benefit of the doubt. I know that's not the case. They really want an answer. But also, I would say if you have a coach that can give you an answer to this question, they are lying to you and they're a used car salesman, basically. You just can't know the answer to this question. It is impossible. Um, so what can influence a guess? Well, the first thing that I would need to know, and I will often tell this to people, is um, first of all, how do we define results? Like, what are we looking for specifically? And usually people are like, well, you know, I'm looking to have this happen and this happen. I'm like, I don't know, man. You know, you're, you're, as far, it's usually something like, I want to see my abs. I'm like, well, I don't know how long you're going to hold on to mid, hold on to body fat in your midsection. So I can't answer that question. That could be the first thing that goes. And maybe you got abs in four weeks. Great. Maybe you get shredded to the bone everywhere, but you still got a gut because you just, your body just wants to hold on to body fat there. So can't answer that. Um, but the biggest factor that influences this is adherence. Like, you know, if I write you a plan, are you going to follow it? I can't assume that you will because most people that I work with don't or they struggle with in doing it and they need help. And that slows down our expectation of results. And so the plan has to be tweaked. It has to be adjusted. This is where the actual act of coaching comes in, helping people learn how to follow a plan better. It's a huge, huge part of what I do. I'd say it's the biggest part of my job, realistically, is coaching people and walking them through what it takes to actually be successful with their plan. Not just telling them what their macros are or how much cardio to do. Yes, that's part of it. But if that's all it was, then great. You know, I could do 150 client check-ins a day and call it good and go live on my private island that I would go to and from via my private jet. That's not how it works. So people take a little bit more time and because you have to actually coach people and help them be successful with the plan help them work through it and find ways to adjust it, alter it, become more efficient with it so that they can be more successful with it. So I don't know if anybody's going to follow the plan or not. So of course I can't answer this question. So let's assume that we follow the plan. Okay. First of all, that is a big giant assumption, right? Uh, genetics are the next biggest factor. And again, this is something that's unknowable. So uh, if you are looking to build muscle or lose fat, you have a genetic predisposition to being, you know, above or below average at both of those independently. So if I look at your current photos, that can provide some insight. So um, if, for example, you say, I've been training for 15 years and you send me photos and it looks like somebody who has never really set foot in the gym, I know you have poor genetics and that's going to be hard. Now also, maybe you've been working out for 15 years and doing everything wrong and not following a diet at all. So, and I would say that's... I hate to generalize and say that's common, 
but it is realistically. Most of the people that, that I work with and who will come to me um, have not really put a, as much effort into their diet as they should. And so they don't really know what they're capable of achieving. And I don't either. Um, I mean, I know what can be done. I don't know how long it's going to take because again, if you haven't done it before, you're going to struggle with it at first. If you're used to eating out three, four, five times a week um, and not doing any meal prep, grab and go, just randomly do shit, like you're in for a change. And the question is, how resistant are you going to be to that change? The more resistant you are to, are to it, the longer we look out as far as how long it's going to take to see these results. If in fact you ever see it, which candidly, you probably won't. Um, if you can't make the big picture change to your diet that's necessary in order to see this kind of change and just embrace that and say like, oh, this is different. This is hard. This kind of sucks a little bit some days. Oh, okay. Ugh, what did I get myself into? Well, I have goals. I'm serious about them. Let's dig in. Boom. If you can do that, okay, we're having a different conversation at that point. If you struggle to do that and you can't get over that hump, we're probably never going to get anywhere realistically. And this is more of a mental barrier for people than anything else. Like I haven't done this before. It's new. It's scary. Therefore I don't want to do it to which I say, fuck all that shit. New and scary is why you hire a coach to hold your hand through that stuff. Like if you want to keep doing what you've been doing and expecting different results, that is, you know, one person's definition of insanity. Don't do that. You're going to have to change some shit, right? If you want to change your body, you're going to have to change a lot of what you're doing. So be ready for that. So Again, photos can provide some insight, but there's going to be a lot of details missing there as well. So um, genetics can, like I said, they can cut both ways, no ways, one way. So, you know, you might have an easier time growing, a hard time leaning out, vice versa, or maybe mo both of them are, are hard. Maybe both of them are easy, but if that's the case, you're probably not watching this video. <laughs> so, and by the way, screw you if that's the case. I hate you. Uh, so what is the real answer? The, my, my real answer here is very simple. And it's to enjoy the process, which I do realize is a complete and total non-answer. But if you don't enjoy and embrace the process, then the entire act of bodybuilding is going to feel like a chore and you will not be successful with it, period. Now, that doesn't mean you have to love every, you know, uh, every non-exciting meal that you eat. It doesn't mean you have to love every minute of your cardio but big picture, you should have a dietary setup in place that you feel good about, that you feel confident in, that you feel satisfied with, that you find rewarding on some level, that shouldn't take a massive amount of time to prep and get ready for. It should be a doable and efficient um, um, amount of work to have to do. I think that's one of the biggest keys. And it should be appealing as well. Cardio, find ways to make it appealing. So for me, I'm watching um, some lecture videos while I'm doing cardio. I'm watching some YouTube videos. I'm listening to music. I'm doing this, that, and the other thing. It just depends on the day. Um, and that keeps my brain engaged because all I need to do is stand on that stupid elliptical and grind it out. Cool. Well, you don't have to be singularly focused on that. You can do other stuff too and multitask a little bit. So you, you find ways to make that stuff more appealing. Um, if you do enjoy the process, you know, results might be slow, but if you're having a good time and learning while you do it, I mean, how is that a problem? And also, if you are enjoying the process, results may be slow, but they are happening, right? And where most people um, go from, hey, I'm doing really well with this to I quit and I fail, it's a lack of patience because they're doing stuff that they don't enjoy doing. So how long will it take to see results? The real answer there is don't ask that question. Learn how to enjoy the process instead. Um, which sounds a lot like, you know, if you're going to buy a new car, how much is the sticker price? Oh, look at these cup holders here. It's like a distraction. But the answer is like, that's not what this is. This is the real answer. And also like, it, I would say <laughs> one, one thing that I, I have taken to, um, is, is telling people to ask a better question. Um, how long will it take me to see results? Define results. Be specific about that, please. Um, what are you looking to do? I'm still not going to be able to answer that question, but let's at least have a non-answer about a good question. So let, let's get specific about what that means, what you're looking for, because then I can say like, okay, this X, Y, and Z is what's important to person A, B, C. So we need to focus on this. How long will it take? I don't know. Let's find a way to make you successful with the program, successful in following it. Let's coach you through that. Let's adjust it as we need to and make sure that you're enjoying it. And then the how long part becomes irrelevant. It's like, how long will it take me to become a uh, absolute shred master on the guitar? By the way, I really enjoy practicing and playing. Cool. Well, who cares how long it'll take then? Enjoy it. Like have fun with that. 
And if you don't enjoy it, why do you want to be a shred master? It's the same thing. A lot of people, they want the results, but they don't want to work, do the work that goes into it. This is the oldest cliche in the coaching and personal training industry. And I feel like a little bit of a hack leaning into it right now, but it's true. It is very true. You get, you know, everybody wants the results. The subset of that that is willing to put in the work to get there is much smaller. One of my biggest frustrations as a coach, whenever some, I've heard this from people so many times where they'll sign up and they'll be like, this is the most important thing to me. I want to do this. And they don't make it to week one. Like they, they don't even get to the first check-in and they're like, I can't do it. Like, well, you're going to need to have a little bit more grit than that. Not only in this, but in everything in life, you know, you need to be, be able to accept the fact that some things are hard. You're going to suck at them. And instead of quitting, you ask some questions and, and make it work. So on this one, like, you know, I, I'm not perfect as a coach, but there are many instances where I take zero blame because if somebody gives up on a program without even asking me a question, I have zero patience for that. Absolutely not. And it, it happens more and more these days now, like in 2023, 2024, post COVID, like I've always had a little bit of that here and there. Post COVID though, something has changed and people's expectations have changed. Their willingness to be flexible to get the results that they're looking for has changed as well. I find it very disturbing as a coach. It's not a trend that I like. So if you are able to enjoy the process, this whole issue of how long becomes irrelevant. It becomes more of a curiosity rather than a, hey, I need to know this, right? So, and a lot of people, they might have a deadline to which I say, extend that deadline out. Because however long you think it's going to take, it's going to take longer than that, probably. Just because you're unlikely to be perfect every day. We could come across some genetic limitations. There may be some issues with your blood work, with insulin sensitivity that have to be addressed, That whatever, that kind of stuff. So you just don't know. You don't know until we actually get rolling and observe some results and see what happens, see how you adhere to the plan. So again, it's not how long, but it's like, enjoy it. Seriously. So... That's it for today. A kind of a shorter episode today. Um, I'm still under the weather. Um, if you can see this on YouTube, like this is my sleepy face. Um, I actually did get eight hours of sleep last night only because I forgot to set my alarm. Uh, so I overslept. And so I'm kind of scrambling today a little bit. Um, training is back on point. Cardio is back on point. So uh, I'm just tired as heck. And still under the weather, still a sore throat, which has now been lingering now for like 12 days, which is super annoying. So ready to put all that behind me. Hopefully when we meet back here next week, That'll all be well and gone. So I don't think I was too short here. I don't know how long of an episode this ended up being, but yeah, long enough, I think. So anyway, I appreciate you all watching. Um, if you are listening in podcast only land, please do leave a review on whatever platform you're listening to. Leave a star rating, whatever you can do there. If you're on YouTube, please like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you like what you're seeing here, leave a comment with questions. If you have ideas for future segments, um, keep in mind, this channel is small right now. Every single comment that gets posted on a video, I see. And so I will respond to everything. I take notes on those things and they all go into a file. So if you comment, I will see it. So now's your chance. Get into the ground floor um, and uh, help develop this show into what you want it to be. Um, and also, uh, if you do want to reach out to me directly, I do have a new email address as of last week. I won't get into the catastrophe that led to that, but it's Darren at five star physique.com as you might expect now. So, uh, you can always reach out to me there. If you have ideas for podcast segments, I'd love to, um, hear from you, any ideas that you have, that's all I got. So I hope everybody stays safe, train hard, and I will see you back here next week. Okay. That wraps up another episode and thank you all so much for watching. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and tag me on Instagram. I am at Darren underscore star. Also, please subscribe to the channel here if you haven't already and feel free to check out any of those other videos that you see here as well. Fivestarphysique.com has details on everything that I have to offer, including contest prep coaching, body transformation coaching, workout programs, swag, and a whole lot more. Thanks again for listening, and I will catch you all back here next week.